Hey everyone, CQ here. This isn't fun to do, but I just wanted to take a quick second to apologize for the sound quality of this video. Point blank, it isn't up to par. There's some clipping and some crackling, and I know it makes it hard to enjoy the content. I'm really sorry about that. I want you to know that I take a lot of pride in the work I put out. I've learned from this, and I've already made changes to ensure that this won't happen again. I've invested in better recording equipment and revamped my setup. Clear and high quality audio is a top priority for me moving forward when I'm in the field. I appreciate all of your support and feedback. Your criticism helps me improve and I wanna thank everyone who's always, always being honest. I'm not happy with the sound on this one, but I promise to do my best to continue to deliver great content and a better viewing experience. I hope you'll give me another chance and continue supporting my work. Thank you for being a part of this journey and stay tuned for more exciting videos to come. Hey guys, it's CQ here. I'm repping WCF Nation Radio and Pop Culture Warrior. It's CQ. I've got uh, the actual King Smith behind the camera. We're here at Fan Expo Philadelphia. Uh, this is an incredible showcase. There's a lot of amazing talents. Uh, we've already, we barely walked in the door and we've already been immortalized in bobblehead fashion. So one of the cool experiences right as we came in the door, I'm gonna have King spin the camera around and show you around real quick. Uh, this is an incredible, incredible showcase. Lots and lots of skin too. Uh, a number of celebrities. There's, there's anime, there's pop culture, there's video games, there's arcades, there's cosplaying. There's so much to see and do. And guess what? We're gonna bring it all right here to you. So hang on, let's hit the show floor. So I'm talking today with Mr. Henry Winkler. You I mean, are very lucky. You are, you are oh an incredible, okay. once in a generation talent, multi generation oh talent. <laughs> so let me ask you a couple quick, quick questions. So we're a military affiliated radio station. Um, do you have a connection to the military, family, friends? Only that I have unbelievable pride in our military and gratitude for everything that everyone does, every man, every woman. It's amazing. That I can be here and be free is amazing. Oh, well, we appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, but let's talk about a, a, a snippet of your career, which is which is decades. Um, your portrayal of Gene Cousineau in Barry is both comedic and nuanced, showcasing your versatility as an actor. How do you approach balancing the humor and depth of a character like Gene? First of all, if it ain't in the writing, it ain't in the stage. It, you know, you don't see it. Bill Hader and him and Alec Berg and those group, that group of writers were amazing. And then they were very unbelievable directors. My job is to bring their vision to life. Outstanding, appreciate it. Uh, now Barry is known for its dark humor, exploration of morality, uh, morally ambiguous themes. Uh, what do you think about the show that resonates with fans so much and how has you know it changed what? the landscape? We're all the same. Everybody, we are all the same. I don't understand the division in our country at this moment. And if you write the truth about being human, it will resonate. I'll show that to you. Thank you so much. Thank really you. appreciate your time, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the day.
Tour. I'm over with at Dave and Adams, DACardWorld.com. What was it, the largest? One of the largest online retailer of collectibles in the world. Largest online retailer of collectibles in the world. And I'm holding something, it's one of my dream pieces. It is Amazing Spider-Man number one, the original. It wasn't the first appearance, but it was his first solo comic. Which, what, what is this going for here? Uh, that one's going for $8,000. $8,000. One day, one day, you'll be mine. I'm gonna hand it back to you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Talking about it, and it's still affecting people. You know, new version of the game coming out. 
uh, I never anticipated any of this. Uh, you now, so, I mean, I was so fascinated because I looked into your back, you know, your history and your work. Sure. So, you've also worked as a screenwriter, uh, including writing the screenplay for the first two X-Men films. Right. I mean, how does your experience as a writer inform your approach to voice acting and then vice versa? That's a good question. Um, you know, I think being a writer helps me understand the storytelling better, um, helps me understand as an actor the beats of the story I need to communicate, and and, uh, and hopefully helps me understand, you know, just the world better, although that is not always the case, because these worlds are a little strange and, uh, you know, sometimes go kind of crazy, sometimes it's just all in Kojima's head, and you have to kind of figure it out, but, uh, but yeah, I think being a writer gives you a different perspective on acting, certainly, and vice versa. So, having written X, X1 and X2, um, did you, at that time, could ever imagine that we'd be in the, the heyday of Marvel films and DC films and all these superhero films that are coming out now? Shows like The Boys. Oh, yeah. Could you ever yeah. imagine something like that possible? I had hoped that would... I mean, I was in these two... I was a part of these two things that sort of changed the culture. So, I did Metal Gear, which kind of turned games into giant movies and made them cinematic, and then I got to work on the first X-Men, which I was a huge comic book fan. It was an enormous honor. And really the key to it was we made those movies not as like, you know, for the first time, you know, people weren't embarrassed about the characters. They weren't like, it wasn't like Batman and Robin where the where it was like, you know, we have to make fun of it and we'll put nipples on it or whatever. You know, I was we were like, no, this is a real story with real characters and real world. And I thought that people would appreciate it, but I didn't know that it would explode like this. I mean, it's been amazing. Uh, so I'll give you one last one. So I know people want to talk to you. Oh, that's um, right. You've been involved in various video games, animated series. How do you approach creating distinct voices for different characters? And then what are some of the challenges and rewards of doing that? That's a good question. I, um, well, you know, the first thing I do is I look at the picture. Um, so, I played this guy, and this guy is young and cocky and, and beautiful, and so, you know, so he had, and I was young, so it was like, it was this kind of voice. Snake, you know, was beat down and already retired and didn't want to come back, and so I felt like he had to have a bunch of miles of bad road behind him. Um, so it's really a matter of looking at the character, looking at their energy, and just trying to match that with whatever you can bring to the group to the park. Uh, last thing, anything you want the folks at home to be looking out for you so they can support your work? Well, uh, I mean, I hope that they play the uh, Metal Gear Delta, and I hope that they enjoy that, that it creates a new generation of fans for Metal Gear. Um, watch my show, Warrior Nun, on, on Netflix. I'm very proud of that, uh, that I did as a writer. And um, I've got a new game, Synapse, coming out for uh, VR. Um, which I'm very proud of. So, uh, you know, check those things out. And to all of my friends in the military, you know, stay safe, come back home, and you're pretty good. Member. Um, we're not super close, but I do know that she is in the military, yes. She's a younger cousin. Okay. And you know, with the Latino families, I don't know if she's my first of, cousin. A lot, my of, <laughs> lot of people. But I know she's my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we? Like, yes. well, I'm also Latino. Oh, uh, yeah. Very Latino, Latino. No. But you know, we, there's, we're all connected by yes, some, we're all connected. some cousin yes, or uncle or whatnot. For sure. Um, okay. okay, so you have voiced the character of Dora the Explorer during the early years of the show. Yeah. 
how did you approach bringing the character to life and, and honestly making her relatable and memorable? Yeah, so it's funny. I started doing her voice when I was seven years old, and we worked on the pilot for three years. Um, and that was my voice when I was younger. So I really have to give credit to the directors and the casting agent. And genetics. Yeah, and that too. Because everyone is like, oh, did they draw her after you? I'm like, nope, I just look like another Latina. Like, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I they heard something in my voice. And, you know, I think she paired really well with the character. And she did become such a lovable and really meaningful character for the Latino community and for a lot of other people. She really represented and meant a lot for us, and she was truly impactful. And I didn't realize that a lot growing up because I was so young. But now, as an adult, it's I feel so blessed and honored to have been a part of it. Absolutely, I, I yeah. can't really recall something um, as inclusive, as diverse of a character prior to that. That was really ushered in a new kind of generation of like. Yeah. Oh, I can be represented on screen. Sure. Right? My family could be. Yeah, um, especially in animation too. Like in children's programming, there wasn't a lot of that. Um, and I think Dora was the start and kind of like paved the way for that. Absolutely. Sure. Without, yeah. without a doubt. Without yeah. a doubt. I can say that. I can say that. As an expert <laughs> yes. in the field well, of pop culture. Well, if you say culture, that, it's true. It's yeah. absolutely true. <laughs> so obviously voice acting requires a unique set of skills yes. and techniques to bring animated characters to life. Yeah. How do you approach character development and convey emotion purely through sound you know it's hard it's different with dora because i grew up doing her voice and that was kind of like my main alter ego i guess but the way that she speaks it's very particular you know in the very like sing-songy but you know how she sounds <laughs> so i definitely learned how she spoke and I had to learn like how to really put emotion into that because how she speaks is kind of very like, you know, I'm teaching you something or like, I really want you to understand. It's really not how people speak on a normal day to day basis. So to make that relatable and to really take the time to understand who Dora was and put emotion to that, I really had to grow and learn to do that. For a yeah. second there, for a second you there, you kind of went <laughs> up yes. and I was like, yeah. oh. There yeah, it, it kind of goes there into how I speak yeah. from day to day. I don't even realize it. Yeah, it's but, yeah. Yeah. Do, yeah, do you yeah. find yourself like trying to not be Dora or because it's so obviously attached to who you are? Yeah, it... so when I was younger or, you know, when I was transitioning out of the role, I really, someone really had to sit me down and be like, you know, I have to, when you're doing like other work that's not Dora, you got to just talk normal. Like, like you're having a conversation just normal. I was like... I got it. I Stop got sounding it. I got like it. you. We need you to sound yes. like someone else now. But got I have it. to really think about it and be like, okay, you're not Dora. Just have, just talk normal. <laughs> okay, All right. fair enough. But, yeah. uh, Dora the Explorer has had such a cultural impact, reaching children around the world, promoting inclusivity and learning. How do you feel now, looking back at the history, the yeah. impact, the, yeah. the it changed the landscape, so many things? How does that? How do you feel about it now? It's overwhelming. I didn't realize how impactful it was. And I've been so distanced from it all for so long. It's been like 10 years since I really, you know, have been a part of like the Dora world. And even today, like, you know, this is my third con, but it starts off with like a few guests, but they just start crying and they like, they hear the voice and it's like memories just come flooding back, like with their kids, with their family members. And it really, you know, it touched so many families and to see that, and I'm a crier too, so once somebody starts crying, I'm like right there with them. But it really means so much to me to have those experiences with these families and with these people and with the fans. Um, it's overwhelming, but in a good way. It really, cool. yeah. It's so awesome. you're, you're still young in the con life. Yes, um, very young. <laughs> I've interviewed some people yeah. and they have some absolutely wild stories. I don't want to scare yeah. you. But there's some wild stories about like fans that are just and nothing negative bad, right. but you know what? Guys who've been given ashes of loved ones because you know they were oh. such a big fan. Here's ashes. No, I haven't. So that. any any anything crazy like that so far? No, wild? and I don't know how I would handle that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll let you know. I'll come back to you. With fans, that one, fans but... can be yeah. you know good bad. Any, yeah. any signing for tattoos or anything like that? No, no, but someone did get a custom Funko Pop because there's not like a door out one, so they had one custom made. So that was pretty cool. Okay. Um, but one of the families that I met uh, in Calgary, it was so cool. It was a daughter. She had her son, 
who she was trying to get what, to watch Zora, and she was there with her mom, who made her daughter watch Zora. So it was kind of like to see like these generations within the family that watched Zora. And again, they all started crying when I did the voice, and it was just awesome to see how like Dora is still moving through like oh, the generations. That. And absolutely, that. so, um, cool. do you have anything uh, coming up? Anything you want to promote? Like, what's the social media tag people can follow you? Yeah, I've been posting a lot on social media, and it's amazing. Like, I love seeing all of the stories, and people are just commenting how much they love Dora, and I I can't believe that people still relate to her and get excited about her. You know, so it's awesome. Um, it's just my name, at Kathleen Herless, on Instagram and TikTok. Um, I'll be posting on YouTube soon, so keep out, keep watch for that. Um, I'm also working on a new project that I can't say exactly what it is yet, but uh, I'll announce it on social media when the time comes, so that'll be exciting. Um, but yeah, I'll be traveling around doing fan expos for the rest of the year, so I'll be meeting more fans. So cool, absolutely. Yeah. What can I ask you, what is, uh, last question, what is, what is the hope? That as you get to do this more and more, connect with the fans, yeah. is there is there something you hope to get from it? Is there hope, something you hope to give from it? What? How do you feel about this? Um, you know, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't think anyone's asked me that before. I mean, right now I'm just having a good time. As I said, I'm very young in this con <laughs> world, but I just love meeting the fans and enjoying every moment. And wherever that takes me, then, you know, I just want to share the love for Dora and spread joy i guess awesome. yeah awesome well thank you so much for your time yeah. we, we so much appreciate it thank uh, you so much. i didn't grow up with dora uh, <laughs> but i was very aware of it yeah you know the cultural relevance of it so i appreciate sure. the work that you put oh, into it thank you. and uh spreading that inclusivity and diversity has been yeah. such a huge important so thank you so much for your thank time you, thank you thank awesome. you Hola, soy Dora, and I'm here at Fan Expo Philadelphia. And if you see Swiper, that sneaky fox, you have to say Swiper no swiping three times, like this. Swiper no swiping, Swiper no swiping, Swiper no swiping. Good job. Bye, adios. Oh my god, I lost. Let me try that again. We're here live at Fan Expo Philadelphia with, I mean, one of the greatest of all time, Joe Quesada. Uh, I mean, there's so many things I could ask you. I'm going to start with, um, as the former editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics uh -huh. and an acclaimed artist of your own right, uh, you've had a significant impact on the comic book industry. How do you approach the creative process and what advice do you give to aspiring guys that, you know, want to do the same thing? Um, I mean, the, the, the advice is really simple. Learn your craft, right? If, if, if you want to be a professional at anything, right? I, I, I loved baseball growing up, right? I wanted to be a baseball player in the worst way. And, and, and you know, if, if, you want to be, if you want to be an athlete, a baseball player in particular, right, what do you do? You go to the batting cage every day. You take the field every day. You're, 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 you're shagging flies. You're hitting, you know, uh, uh, fielding ground balls. You're doing it every day, right? Same thing if you want to be an artist, if you want to be a writer. You write every day, you draw every day. Even if nobody sees it, right? You do it and you do it, and what happens is that you get incrementally better and every day you build on the day before, right? So there's, there is no shortcut to it, right? You, you can be the most talented person in the world, but you will get your ass whooped by someone who's not as talented as you because they're putting in the work, right? What was that Alan Iverson thing? That, yeah. yeah you, I, I paraphrase it, right? While, yeah. while, you're, while you're sleeping, I'm, 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 up, shooting. I'm yeah. up shooting, right? Yeah. That's exactly it. Um, and so what was the other part of the question? Um, oh, just uh, kind of um, your approach to the creative process. My approach to the creative process is um, I do not create in fear. You know, so uh, I, 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 if, if I feel strongly about something, I just I, I put it out there. But at the same time, I also create. I, I'm in I'm in the, I'm in the commercial side of the business, right? So 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 what I do when I was at Marvel, what I do when I'm not at Marvel, 
is that I want to create product that sells, right? And so to do that, and by the way, I don't mean that facetiously. I mean, some people are just like, you know, I, I'm, cre- I, I'm creating art, but I'm creating art for the, I'm trying to create art for the masses, trying, because you never know if you're actually going to succeed. So I always have to keep the audience in mind. What do I think the audience might want? Because as creators, we really don't. We don't know. We we don't know any more what the audience wants than what the audience knows until they sort of get it, right? So I just I just try to keep everybody in mind when I'm trying to create something. And and, and at the end of the day, it says if, if I don't like it, I'm not going to put it out, right? Because if I don't like it, I, don't, I can't imagine anybody else would. But so I start from that point of like, you know, do I love it? Is my heart into it? And then just put it out there and hope that people like it. Yeah, that's awesome. One of the questions, because we are kind of a military affiliated themed you right. know show um do you have a personal collection to the mi- military a family yes. friend anything like that yeah so so um, i am first generation born here in the states my my, my parents my, my grandparents came from cuba but they came here before the revolution so my grandfather came in uh the late 30s to to came here to the states um to try to you know make a living and then and then send for the family and a little thing called World War II broke out. And they gave him the choice. He said, listen, you're, you're not a citizen of the United States, so you have a choice. We, we go back to Cuba, or if you enlist and you make it out alive, you become a U.S. citizen. So my grandfather's like, I'm in. So he made it as, you know, he made it for the rank of a corporal, got out alive, you know, and then uh, eventually sent from the family. And then when the family got here, uh, my dad, got here in Korea after. So my dad fought in Korea. Uh, so we have a, you know, we have a two, you know, a, a, a double generational legacy of being in the U.S. Army. Um, and, you know, I, 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 you know, I was born after Vietnam. I was, you know, so, but, uh, so, you know, I've been in a position where I was, you know, fortunate enough to not have to, you know, be drafted. But if I had, I would have gone. I mean, that's, Absolutely. It's plain and simple. I mean, it's like, you know, when you have a family history like that, you got to go. You know, that's something right? to be incredibly proud of. We, yeah. we thank them for their service. Um, I, mean, I, I told you we did bump into each other in New York's Comic Con years ago. Prior to that, actually, so I was wounded in uh, Afghanistan. I spent time in Walter Reed, the Army Medical Center. Um, what, what of like, because I was kind of supposed to die. So one of the wishes I had was like, man, like it'd be my dream. I'm obviously I'm a huge nerd, Marvel nerd, and, and, and whatnot. But I said I would love to go to like Marvel headquarters, right. and somehow, some way, they made it happen. I got a tour of Marvel headquarters right. in New York City, and you were the editor in chief in time. And I remember whoever was showing me around, like we popped into your office real quick, and I like you said hi. You were very, you were very sweet. And at the time, you had to be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a call from Kevin Feige. Right. And like I think we were talking Iron Man. Right. It was before all that that all exploded. So yeah. um, I, I always I feel a little connected to the universe. Yeah. Where I'm like I was kind of there. I was I was in the round. But I mean, how do you feel? You know, being you know, obviously you had work involved in the Netflix Daredevil series and whatnot. How do you feel about where we are in the current? I mean, Marvel, DC, The Boys, all yeah. of that. I mean, you know, it, it's funny. I I, I feel. In some ways, I feel vindicated because you know, I, I from from the moment that I came in as editor in chief of Marvel, I, I kept talking about that you know the, the the comics are in this sort of entertainment ghetto, but I always felt it was self-imposed. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it was a feeling of you know, uh, like the only like the, like the industry itself wasn't necessarily proud of what it was doing, and I'm like, come on, guys, really? Uh, and it's, it's taken it's taken the mainstream. A long time to figure out how great the stuff we, we do is, but I also think that has to do a lot to do with technology because the way I see it, you know, Jack Kirby was drawing stuff like the craziest stuff on, in the world in 1962, and it literally took entertainment, science, technology, like 40 years to catch up to be able to put on screen what Jack could put on paper, and I think that has a lot to do with it. Uh, people going, wow, wow, this is the most incredible stuff we've seen. And, and, and people like you and me, we've been reading this stuff for years. For it. it's, like, it's like, wait, oh, for it. okay, yeah, your eyes are open, you know, you've been to the mountain. We were there a long time ago, right? Uh, it, it's, you know what, it's really satisfying to see. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, 
from my point of view, I've been very fortunate that I work in Marvel. Um, I, I, I always, it, anybody that works at Marvel, we should all consider ourselves, for lack of a better word, we're creative trust fund babies, right? We, you know, we inherited this library of stuff. And look, some of it we created, we added on to it, right? But, but we can't add on to something that, that wasn't there, right? So, so, so we inherited this fortune, and it was our job to then invest it properly and build it, or spend it frivolously on booze and, and parties and stuff, you know. But, you know, I, I think the team at Marvel from 2000 on, you know, they did the right thing. They, they did, you know, it was, it was a team effort. And all the right moves were made. And that's why we're here where we are now. You know, I was, uh, I was here for 22 years, man. It was a lot of fun. And I know you got people, so I'm going to ask you one last question. Uh, looking back Thank at you, your... You're more important. <laughs> uh, uh, looking back at your career, yeah. kind of everything that you were involved with, like... Where are you most proud of, like, that has your thumbprint, right? Like, what, what mark did you leave that you're most proud of? All right, so this, this, this is a little bit of a longer answer. So, so when I got into the comics, when, when, when I got, I read comics as a kid, dropped them uh, at a certain age. I was reintroduced to comics when I was 25 years old, and, and I was reintroduced literally the same day. I, I, I had a, an issue of Watchmen and an issue of Dark Knight Returns in my hand. They had just come out. And I read these books, and it was like, Whoa, right? And uh, and I've always been very, very big on on role modeling and, and 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 setting goals for myself, right? So the goal in my mind was, in some ways, it was kind of unattainable, right? Which was someday I want to write a story or draw a story or write and draw a story that is as good as Watchmen or Dark Knight. And I've never done that, right? Nobody really has, right? But somebody somebody pointed this out to me, and I'm like, oh, it's like, you know, when I when I look at the cumulative stuff that I've done over the years, right, working with some of the most incredible talents on the planet, I guess my Watchmen is just sort of it was a Marvel for 22 years, right? It was Marvel for 20 years. We had we had some great stuff, um, you know. The company was in Chapter 11 uh, when we took over, and you know, uh, again, not does it happen in the vacuum, but I was. I was part of this great American comeback story, right? Uh, riches to rags, it's a super rich, right? So that I think to me, that's probably, to this point, because I'm not done, right? To this point, that's that's the one thing when I look back on, on what I've done, um, it's just my history with the company, you know? And, and the fact that uh, I, 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 you know, I got to leave and, uh, I love everybody there, man. You weren't yeah. chased out of the building. That's a good no, thing. No, you know, I, I, it's, you know my, my, my father always said, like, you know, if you leave at the top of your game, whatever it is that you do, right? And he was talking baseball at that time, but, you know, uh, and that always stuck with me. So, I, you know, uh, I love Marvel. I love these characters. And I, but I love, I, more than anything, I love the comics industry. So that's why I'm, you know, I'm still here. I've got some Hollywood stuff that I do here and there, but this is always home. Outstanding, man. Well, we want to thank you for your time. Anything you, you want to promote? Man. Anything coming out that you want people to check out? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Actually, no, that's not true. I just, I just started a Substack. Okay. So you guys have to subscribe. Okay. We'll, we'll get, so we'll get, we'll get. literally, I, my, like I started it last week. So it's uh, it's called Joe Posada's uh, uh, Drawing the Line Somewhere. So if you're not on Substack, by the way, and it's free, it's all free, 100 percent free. Uh, and I'm just you know telling stories. Uh, behind the scenes stuff, tutorials, awesome. uh, this like comic industry advice, just sort of the way that I see things, you know. Uh, so I finally I found a good place to like put it all down. We'll make sure we tag it, we'll cool. make sure we share it, and uh, we appreciate your time, man. Thank you, for Thank you so right. much, appreciate Thank it. Thank you.
We've reached the end of day one at Fan Expo Philly. I am sweating. I am tired. I'm exhausted. My feet are killing me, but it was a fantastic first day here at the con. Uh, we got to talk to David Hayter. We got to talk to Henry Winkler, Joe Quesada. We talked to uh, uh, Kathleen, the voice of Dora. We got to speak to so many people with way more interviews coming down the pipe. Everybody was so wonderful. The, the, the retailers here, the vendors were incredible. Prices were, at a time when prices are out of control, prices were actually pretty uh, nominal, uh, as you would expect. The panels were great. Uh, all the people were smiling and happy. Uh, couldn't ask for a better day. So uh, with that, we're going to wrap up this day here. I'm exhausted. I'm hungry. I want to go home. Uh, this is the first con of many for the summer season. Very excited to see what else we have in store. So stay tuned. We'll see you next time.